City of Casey. I'm also chairman of the South Carolina Sound Money Committee, and I welcome you to join this FY. We have Jeff Kirk, the first one of our five hour conference. Jeff, thank, thanks for being with us. And thank you. I just want to go through the highlight, and this is what's going to happen tonight. We've already had technological problems. I always assume the worst, and thank goodness we had some backup plans. And thanks to Patricia for calling her guys to get our internet speed back up. But let me just give an overview, and Patricia and others will give a biographical in-depth introduction of each speaker. Jeff Turk is with goldmoney.com in London, England. Uh, Dr. Larry Parks, Ph.D., Executive Director of FAME, which is the Foundation for the Advancement of Monetary Education, New York, New York, Manhattan. Dr. Edwin Vieira, Jr., Ph.D., J.D., Harvard, this country's on leading legal scholar on legal issues and related to money. He's coming out of Manassas, Virginia. Tom Moore. Lives and writes in Alexandria, Virginia, and is our expert on how the government works from the inside. It's my pleasure and honor to now present Tom Moore. Tom is going to discuss why this economic summit is so important to South Carolina. Tom. This extraordinary event. I'm just uh, amazed to see this many people of such stature and leadership uh, present for this type of event. Uh, I am billed here as an expert on how our government works from the inside. Uh, I'm not a subject matter expert. Uh, you're going to hear from the most authoritative subject matter experts in the world. Uh, so I will be brief, but I'm not even sure that it's correct to bill me as an expert on how government works. Um, what I know about our government, I learned by watching movies about organized crime. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that our government is the largest organized crime syndicate. And one way that uh, it functions is because its power rests upon a monopoly ability to create fraudulent money out of thin air. I'm 62 years old. And for nearly 50 of those 62 years, I've been involved in some capacity or other in politics, campaigns, as a public policy leader, uh, in government service, as a political appointee. And the thread that runs through all of that was, or has been, a love of liberty, a hunger for liberty, and the defense of liberty. And while most of you here are younger than I am, I think that same thread is what's brought you here. You are freedom fighters or you wouldn't be here. But when I look back on those 50 years, I have to say, we haven't done so well, have we? We certainly are no freer than we were when I began working in the Workman and Spence campaign in 1962 and then the Goldwater campaign in 1964. We're not any freer. In fact, uh, our freedoms are under attack from all points of the compass. The flame of freedom is actually in danger of guttering out and being extinguished altogether and plunging us into the darkness and nightmare of unrelieved totalitarianism and corruption. So why is it? Why haven't we done better? I believe it's because we've been focused almost exclusively on electing people to office. If we just select more Republicans, just elect more conservatives, everything will be fine. And I'm not suggesting we should suspend our efforts to do that, but I think what we need to understand and what tonight will help us understand is that the key issues, as Steve said, really the, the key mechanism of our control is monetary. And it is that ability to create money out of thin air that was given to a private, secretive, and conspiratorial banking cartel known as the Federal Reserve, which we know now is neither federal nor has any reserves, 
It just has the ability to loan money into existence. And so the money that we depend on today, having no backing at all, is simply a unit of accounting of debt. If we understand this, we understand that that is both our means of oppression, but it's also the Achilles heel of the regime that oppresses us. Because that fiat money, that money loaned into existence, is failing. So tonight, we're going to learn how to exploit that vulnerability of the enemy. Their money, their means of control is failing. And we have an opportunity, using the sovereignty that we still enjoy, and while we still enjoy it, to take control of our financial and economic destiny and to free ourselves from this primary mechanism of control that the regime exercises over us and which both impoverishes us and enslaves us. So that I think is the significance. That's why you're here. With this many intelligent, informed activist people, we could transform the situation that we now face create, I won't say just sound money, but honest money, money that is not fraudulent, because that's really why it's failing. It isn't failing just because it's based on bad economic theory or bad political theory. It's failing because it is dishonest. It is fraudulent. It violates that commandment that says, thou shalt not steal. So uh, I'm glad you're here. I hope you will learn and then take the lessons uh, that we all learn tonight, because I'm here to learn as much as you, and apply those in a practical way in the political sphere so that once again, we will be free, sovereign, and independent citizens based, basing our economic life upon honest currency. I thank Patricia and Ray Moore and Steve Ice. Jeff Turk is with us tonight, and the reason that he is speaking right now is because Jeff is speaking to us from London. I think it's nearing midnight there, isn't it, Jeff? <laughs> uh, coming up on 11, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, Jeff is the co-founder and CEO of goldmoney.com, one of the largest providers of physical bullion for retail and institutional investors. He's also the inventor of several patents in the field of digital gold currency and the active member of Gold Money Foundation, a not-for-profit educational organization created to promote and support educational initiatives that expound the principles of sound money. And a lot when I go talk to people is, how are we going to do this? So I think Jeff has some answers for us. Something that uh, you'll find a value and we'll learn from uh, in this next 15 minutes or so while I speak. Um, understand there is a PowerPoint presentation in front of you on a screen right now. Hopefully uh, that's the case. Uh, if we can, somebody can take us to uh, slide two. What I'd like to do is give you a little background on what is digital gold currency. Uh, odd mix of terms, uh, three very different words meaning three very different things. Uh, I'd say in a nutshell what digital gold currency is, is it's the application of information technology and the internet to circulate a time-tested and globally recognized form of money. Um, that in a, from a very high level I think describes it and you know to really get a, a proper sense of what it is and uh, how it works I, I think we need to uh, look at each of these words separately and weirdly enough in reverse order you know looking at the meaning of currency as it's used in this in this uh, term the meaning of gold and finally the meaning of digital and once we've gone through those three terms together uh, i think uh, i can paint a picture for you of what it is how it's used and some of the interesting aspects that it can bring uh, in light of the times we're in uh, the, the current system that we function under from a monetary point of view and some interesting ways that we can perhaps put a new perspective on that. So going here to uh, slide three, um, starting off with the word currency. Uh, we, we really use these the words money and currency uh, often interchangeably, but there is in fact a difference between them. You know, money from its classic 
definition, traditional definition is described as, first of all, a medium of exchange, something that we use to uh, basically transfer uh, goods and services amongst each other and have a measuring stick that we can use to, uh, to, to measure the value of everything that we're transacting it day in, day out. It's also a unit of account, um, you know, again, following on from that measuring stick analogy. And finally, and you know, probably most importantly, is the store of value. Um, what you have money today that you hold it and hold with you, ideally you want it to buy you at least as much uh, five years, 10 years down the road from now as it can buy for you today. So those three, those three things describe what we traditionally refer to as money. And you know, to, to make the point very clear at the end here, money is, from my point of view, uh, a measuring tool. And we use it to calculate our subjective measures of value, measurements of value. So going on to the next screen, currency is basically money in its physical form. So currency is the physical representation of this mental measuring tool that we call money. So currency has you know, traditionally been coins. You know, up until recently, it's generally been gold and or silver coins. Uh, paper notes, which ultimately started to replace, replace coins over time as, as, um, to more, more easily facilitate the transfer of precious metal uh, historically. And finally, other monetary instruments that we have today, we have bank checks, uh, bank cards, credit cards, ATM cards, things of that nature. These are all essentially forms of currency and I consider a currency like a language in the sense that I have an idea that I express in my, or I think in my head, uh, which is the monetary calculation of what I want to buy and things like that. And then currency is the, the means by which I express that measurement of value. And you know, which we use currency exchange goods and services in the marketplace. So with that aside, you know, this distinction of what currency is, the physical representation of money, I go on to the next slide here, slide five, which is getting into the, world, uh, the word gold. Now, I think most everybody here agrees tonight that gold is money, and it's fulfilled this role for thousands of years. And even can still does that today in some form or another. And why is gold money, and why has it had this role for thousands of years? Um, there, there's really, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but I, I think you can boil it down to basically three, three main reasons here. One is it's scarce. You can't create gold out of thin air. There's, hard work is involved in extracting it, either through mining or you know, mining from the ground. Uh, there's there's, 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 there's uh, open pit mines. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. But the bottom line is it's hard work. And uh, a, a fixed amount of it uh, per year is extracted. And you know, it, coincidentally, the growth in population over uh, over the period over the world's history has, and the uh, extraction of gold has roughly been running in parallel. So, there's generally just enough gold in the world to serve the form as money, and not uh, not often a shortage, and not often a surplus of it either. Um, it also, the second point here is it's fungible. So. An ounce of gold uh, in one person's hand and an ounce of gold in another person's hand, if it's exactly an ounce, it's basically the same thing. Uh, and whether it was mined last week or 500 years ago, that ounce of gold is, is pretty much interchangeable with any other ounce of gold out there. So that makes a, a second point, making it a very good form of money. And finally, and most importantly, uh, gold, unlike any other commodity in the world, is accumulated. Most of the gold that's been mined and extracted over you know, the thousands of years of human history still exists somewhere in some form today. It's you know, jewelry on, around somebody's neck. It's a gold coin in somebody's hand. It's a, um, a bullion bar in a, a bank vault, whatever. Most of the gold in the world is still there. And be, it's because of this fact that gold is accumulated and that it really sets it apart as, as a unique form of money because it's there to serve one specific purpose, and that's really just serving a monetary role. Sure, there's there's jewelry and adornment purposes, particularly in the Far East, um, you know, where it's quite popularly used for adornment. But underlying that is a monetary function. It's a store of value. And going on.